Hello and welcome to the first edition of Understanding Narcissus Q&A, where I will attempt to answer your questions as best I can. First off, I just want to thank everyone for their questions because there have been a lot of fantastic questions. And if I don't get to your question in this session, I will try to do so in a later episode. So let's jump right in. The first question is, hi, Scott. Hi, Shauna. Thank you for asking your question. Just wondering what your experience is with NPD. Was it with a family member? I am going through the discard phase with my NPD ex-boyfriend and wondering what your tips are for moving on. I just watched your videos with general tips, but do you have specific tips? How did you personally move on? And how long does it take to move on? I've been really discouraged hearing about people who are hung up with hurt for years after the NPD. I know it's different for people who cannot go no contact due to family reasons or whatnot. Thank you for your advice and sharing your own experiences. Um, so there's a few things interwoven in there that I'd like to get to. The first is I can't give anybody a magic pill or secret that will prevent narcissists from hurting them forever. The people who aren't particularly hurt by narcissists, um, incidentally, will never be ex to them in the first place that is they'll never be wrapped up in their abuse because they aren't predisposed to being abused by them and so they kind of just don't respond the reception isn't there and the narcissist knows it because the person does not react in the way that the narcissist needs them to and so they never end up in that position what I'm trying to say is there's a predisposition element that to some extent will always expose you to their abuse and always allow them to hurt you. Now you can still control your reaction and you can still um, improve from there, but I don't want to imply that at some point you will feel no pain. It could happen, I just can't promise it or guarantee it because I'm not able to do it um, with any real absolute certainty. So I could probably go into a more specific um, method or series of methods in a different video. Um, so I'm definitely going to do that, maybe even make it a series. What I will say here is that it's always a personal journey. There's always that arc of you have to sort of experience it for yourself. So you're going to make revelations, you're going to make big inroads but they're going to be a special to you. And I can chart those specific things that will occur and maybe how to accelerate them, how to recognize them when you see them. But you will have to go through a certain process that kind of deprograms your mind from the abuse in the first place. So it sort of unravels all of the patterns and the things that expose you to narcissists and allow you to kind of broaden your perspective. And I'm not trying to say that in a in a superior way like you are narrow-minded. It's just that you have um, tunnel vision because of the narcissistic abuse. And so kind of when you're in that confined high-pressure environment and really those emotions you come across the same things again and again as in the cycle. And so you feel like it's just happening over and over, I'm not getting any better and I can't improve. But that really is kind of a necessary part of the recovery phase um, or process and it continues well after the narcissist. So there are ways to accelerate it, there are ways to deal with it in the immediate, you know, that'll make you feel better, but there is going to be some pain involved um, in order to get to the point where you can readily, I don't want to say dismiss it, but move past it and regard it in a different way, like you're not always preoccupied with it and not always vulnerable to what they said to you in the past, how they made you feel, and then that kind of reverberating again and again and hurting you. So I hope that answered your question and thank you so much for your question. The next question is, I am a big fan of yours, and I am so happy you gave me a chance to ask a question. Thank you. I appreciate your support and your question. 
My best friend for 17 years is a grandiose, spiritual, narcissistic sociopath. I like the addition of spiritual in that because it's really significant to narcissists. He does mushrooms and acid on a microdose level, claiming that he is awakened, wanting to ditch the 9 to 5 survival life and become a rapper, outrageous attitude including molesting his friends and wanting to take the gay out of everyone. If you defend yourself physically, he calls you out for overreacting. Believes that his friends' significant others are sexually attracted to him and thinks he has the right to joke about wanting his friends' girlfriends to give him any form of sex. Peer pressures people to do mushrooms and acid with him for spiritual awakening. Made some really bad decisions in his life because he is delusional, wants to be rich and famous, and be known for helping others. My question is, why do narcissists take spirituality to their advantage? Okay, so the first thing I want to note is there's a lot of things going on with this guy that I have no expertise in. Um, he seems to be comorbid, if that is even a um, contemporary term, if that term's still relevant and used anymore. So there's a bunch of things I could ask you regarding his behavior that might give me more insight into, my, into his behavior and then into my answer, it would inform my answer. But needless to say... There's a lot of volatility going on there that may not intertwine with the narcissism. It may have something to do with the narcissism. It's very hard to say um, without more information. But your question had to do with spirituality. And that is so significant because it is a universal with narcissists. Somehow this almost axiomatic belief, this sort of thing that you can't prove that makes them superior to everyone else. Why do they do that? It can be politics, you know, a political identity. It can be spiritual, like you described. Um, it's like they're somehow informed, whether it be through a explicable means, like scientifically, for instance. Now, I know that's that seems divorced from what you're saying, but it's really not, because if you break it down, their beliefs, spiritual or not, I would call it, you know, their own narcissistic spirituality, because it's stuff that is really intangible. It's not stuff you can grab onto and prove, even if they act like it is. It's not something that really is demonstrable in, in their competence. You see what I'm saying? That it actually makes them better. They're actually good at something. It's just something that they make you feel. And that's what I'm trying to get at. They feel superior, and so they find channels, usually as legitimate as they can find, that allow them to express and carry that superiority over everyone. So that's really what it's about. They, they look for these vehicles, these paths, that allow them to behave in a way that is superior. And... I think most importantly, convey it to others so that it's irrefutable, you know, it's undeniable emotionally, and that people just respond to it. Remember, it's the response we're looking for. They need people to project this image of the narcissist for the narcissist. That's what the narcissist wants. And so remember that it's the response that they're concerned about they need people to project this image of themselves so that they can see it and be actualized and be comforted by it. That's what they need going on all the time and that's what they do all of the time. There's really no getting around that. So whether it be spiritual or political or any other kinds of beliefs, um, any kind of corpus or body of work or, or some kind of set of principles that they don't necessarily really understand or care about, they just parrot, so they can kind of just use them as stepping stones to lording it over people. And hopefully in a fashion that's believable and legitimate um, for their illusion. You know, it'll line up with aspects of their personality, their, their natural inclination, because um, that's there um, as well. And so that will determine how they'll express that superiority. The next question, information about narcissists and spirituality. Hopefully I just answered that with the last question. 
and also protecting your teenage children from their narcissistic parent when they don't accept or understand what's happening. Okay, so this is another universal, and it's a really, really big deal because it is just going to happen if you have children with a narcissist. So think about that for a second and think about the narcissist relationship with their child, the child in question or children in question from birth to adolescence to their teenage years. What's it like? It gets steadily worse. Why is that? And why does it tend to become really inflamed during the teenage years? Well, what's happening when you're a teen? You're growing into an adult, right? An adult who thinks for themselves, who acts according to their own interests and will and aspirations and whatnot. So therein lies the problem. Narcissists don't get along with other people anyway, and they especially don't get along with adults. And all of a sudden, this little child who they could sway and control and, and seemingly for the most part, believes everything the narcissist says and does, um, doesn't anymore and starts to question them and maybe even resist them in a passive way. Because children will naturally move towards the loving parent and not the narcissistic parent, and that's kind of okay. You know, for the narcissist, they don't really want to take care of kids anyway. But then all of a sudden, they might start questioning the narcissist, and that's a problem. So you've got people who are part of the illusion, the children, who are embedded in it and who have to really promulgate it, and all of a sudden, they don't really do that anymore, and they might even resent the narcissistic parent. And the narcissist is going to head that off and see that coming from a mile away and have a problem with them. They will label and target the teenage child. They will um, do whatever they can to dismantle that whole thing. So it's going to be an ongoing conflict. It's not going to go away, um, unfortunately. And so your question is, what can you do about it? Well, the only thing you can do about it is what you do about it for yourself, which is you have to inform yourself and you have to get your head around the whole problem of narcissism and understand what's going on. So your teenager has to reach that conclusion, the narcissist conclusion on their own, but with your help. So whenever you persuade anyone about narcissism, they're not going to believe you, right? You don't go talking about it with people who've never experienced it or people who've never reached that point where they can accept it in their own lives because of personal issues or they're still embroiled with a narcissist or whatever. As they make that discovery for themselves that there's something rotten about their narcissistic parent, you can help them along by not bombarding them, but kind of giving them something to work with as to why it's happening and help them make progress and support them, of course, and be the loving parent, the parent they need really, you know, both parents that they need and help them make that discovery. That's really the only way to do it. That's the only thing you can do. And it has to happen because they're becoming adults and they're not narcissists. They, they have to, they have to reach that conclusion on their own and feel like they reach that conclusion on their own. It's the only way they're going to be able to internalize it and really understand it um, and move on in their lives. Great question. Next question. Is one of the narcissist's weapons to let others wait? And if someone makes a remark, the reaction is, why do you hurry? The lunch is on the table. Everybody is hungry. He has to make a phone call. All dressed up to walk the dog. He has to change his clothes. Good Lord, that sounds like my dad. Um, yeah. Everything is, for the most part, a passive maneuver. Narcissists don't like to be the first to, you know, the first strike in an explicit way. So they need to provoke you in a way that gets you to react so that they can respond as if they're being attacked. Because that's what mirrors what's going on in their mind. They are victims. They believe it. They feel it. They know it. It's true. And so for that to be echoed, you know, throughout the house or wherever you live, um, that's what has to happen. You have to be the one who's coming after them and hurting them and trying to get them. Now, then you ask, well, why are they with you in the first place? If, if that's the case, well, it's because they're such good people and they love you and support you so much that they're willing to deal with your abuse. That's how it has to go. That's actually what they believe and feel. 
So what can you do about it? Honestly, not that much. Because once you realize it and you stop reacting, therein um, a problem forms where they start to kind of blow up because they can't let all of that out, all of that angst and that sort of malicious desire. They need to express it. When they can't, that means something bad has to happen. And so at that point, they become unhinged and very volatile, and anything can happen. So that's why you react the way you do, because you will have um, a little nagging sensation that you need to give them what they want, or else something worse will happen. So with the things you asked, I can't remember all of them, but really being a stick in the mud, that is just their bread and butter. That's what they do all the time. The walking out, the upsetting the, the established schedule, making everybody conform to the schedule, but they don't. And so you have to worry about them and wonder what they're doing and, and stress you out. That's about as narcissistic as it gets. When I think of narcissist, that's what I think of because that's what I grew up with and that's what I know. So yes, all of those things are going on. I think it might also be to feel special and express their superiority again, where um, everybody has to conform to certain rules and do things, but they don't. They don't have to do anything. They get to do whatever they want because they're just amazing. The next question is, do narcissists feel joy? Like true, unadulterated happiness. Can they feel such a thing? Is there maybe an element of depression to narcissism? From what I can tell, um, because I don't know what they feel and they don't tell you what they really feel, that's my hypothesis, um, I'm going to guess that they don't feel the same things we do when we talk about happiness and joy. I think there are varying degrees of it. Um, I assume you're talking about true narcissists. I would say I don't think they experience that in the same way at all. I don't know exactly what they experience. And the depression, um, I really can't say. I have, I have no idea because I've never seen one alone where no one's watching them or they think no one's watching them and they're acting as they would without anyone around. I don't know. I, so I really can't answer that. I suspect no. I don't, I don't think they experience things the same way. I think they are stuck in that drive um, to control and that's really what they're preoccupied with all the time. They can't break away from it. They are compelled to it. So I don't think I don't think they're familiar with the range of feelings and experiences we are because they don't really get to them. I think they're stuck in that very childlike um, grabbing for a parent type me mentality, and that's probably what's going on most of the time. But it's kind of up in the air. I'm not really sure. So that concludes part one of the Q&A video. Um, I hope you liked it. Like it if you do. Share it with somebody you think might benefit from it. Thank you so much for watching and leave your comment in the comment section below about how you think it can be improved and, and what questions you may have and what you'd like to see in future videos. Thank you so much for your support. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I will see you in part two of the Q&A. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.